I'm Melanie Sayward and you are tuning in to The Pink Elephant. Hi there and welcome to The Pink Elephant Podcast. It's been great to have some interviews, but in this episode, we return to the usual kind of content that you've gotten used to me producing. We're going to continue to go deeper in the core principles of faith with the view to growing into greater witnesses and followers of Jesus. So before I proceed, I just want to apologize for this crazy, croaky throat that I still have. This is the uh, lasting uh, impact of COVID that I had a couple of weeks ago. But um, I'm just hoping that my uh, good old friend Joel, who edits and, and mixes all this, can uh, make me sound like a beautiful, pristine unicorn and how we would imagine that they would speak because that's what I consider to be a really smooth kind of voice. I don't know. Anyway, with the last episode being all about the prophetic, the timing seemed right to do an episode on the spiritual gifts in general. Spiritual gifts is kind of a difficult topic to talk about really because whilst we can all go deeper ourselves and especially within our own specific spiritual gift, I realise that so much of our experience of spiritual gifts in general is dependent on the communities we find ourselves in. With all that being said, this is still a critical aspect of faith. So let's proceed. The most obvious place to start would be to answer this question, what are spiritual gifts? Now, I'm not an expert, but this is what I have understood from all of the things that I've read, learned, whatever, right? When we receive Christ, we receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. Consequently, the Holy Spirit imparts a gift that is unique and it is at his discretion in terms of the type of gift. There is nothing to say in Scripture how the mechanics of that work nor how he determines who gets what. All we know is that it is a Holy Spirit-empowered gift and it's not something you can manufacture in your own strength. And Scriptures are really specific in saying that these gifts are for the building up of the church, for the edification of the church is a word that's often used. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14 verse 12, So with yourselves, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. Now, we aren't supposed to use these gifts to determine the evidence of the Spirit of God. We are encouraged to look at the fruit of a person's life to determine that. But spiritual gifts are exactly that. They are a gift. And most people find joy in being able to express these gifts to their fellow believers. And I'll say one more thing before we move on. These spiritual gifts are really, really important. They aren't like the optional extra of like heated seats when you buy a new car. They're probably not the steering wheel or the engine either, but they are somewhere in the middle in terms of significance to the overall vehicle. Okay, so important question. How do you find out what your spiritual gift is? Now, you may already know what it is, but for those of you who don't, You can actually do a spiritual gifts test like you can do them online. The most reliable one I have used is spiritualgiftstest.com, so it's quite easy to find, and I've used it many times and referred many people there. And I also know that plenty of churches also recommend this like as part of their volunteer programs. They refer people to that specific website. And, yeah, so it's a reputable website. Most people I know have got sort of one major gift but two or even maybe four other gifts, right? So you do get more than one gift but one is somewhat superior to the others in terms of its influence in your own faith and how you contribute, right? But here's the thing, they can change because at the end of the day, these spiritual gifts tests that we do, they are a self-questionnaire. So the success of the test relies on your comprehension of the questions based on your level of exposure and experience at the time. So for instance, these days I score pretty highly on prophecy, but maybe 10 plus years ago I was having visions and dreams and I and I wouldn't have understood that that was actually called prophecy. But because I have spent more time in prophetic environments now, I now understand that my dreams especially are prophetic. So when I did that test maybe 10 years ago, I don't think I got prophecy at all on my top five, yet now it is the highest. And so that knowledge no doubt, you know, impacts like what what you respond to in a questionnaire, like your actual preconceived knowledge about those different gifts does affect how you answer the questions. But it's not entirely influenced by your interpretation. So there's still some 
uh, validity to those uh, types of spiritual gifts tests. There is some things that it can pick up on that even though you may not be aware of and it, it can still like pump out to you a whole bunch of like this is your spiritual gifts, right? Now, like for instance, I have never planted a church in my life, right? And um, I'm not even 100% sure I really want to. It's not, not necessarily been something that I've always gone, oh, I want to plant a church, which I know lots of people do. But for as long as I can remember, I have consistently had apostleship as a spiritual gift. Most of the time it was number one. Uh, and then until prophecy recently has taken that position. But it still is there, like usually as a second now, uh, even though I've had no idea, like at times what apostleship even means. I actually don't even think I knew what church planting was like maybe 10 years ago, and yet I was still getting apostleship as a, as a primary gift. We can also learn about spiritual gifts through people. There are those like odd people in church. I'm not saying that people are odd, but, but the frequency in which you meet them uh, that can just pick up very quickly what a person's spiritual gifts are. You know, they just have a knack for it. And um, most of the time they're really passionate about it as well. Now there is one more thing. There is this thing that you may hear about. So I'm just kind of giving you all the general information about spiritual gifts right now especially if you've come from a Pentecostal tradition. I've heard of it talked about more in Pentecostal traditions than probably any other. It's called the five-fold ministry gifts. So the five-fold ministry gifts refers to the specific gifts that were noted in Ephesians 4 verse 12, which says, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ. So, there are five apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, or it's also sometimes uh, referred to as pastors and teachers. They have been specifically given to equip the body of Christ as empowered by the Holy Spirit, as determined by the Holy Spirit, right? So the fivefold ministry gifts are apparently when one person can actually embody all five gifts. Now, when I was first told this, I was not super keen on that like philosophy, on that belief. I was like, mm, nah, I have never seen in any circumstance that God would create this super gifted person, you know, obviously besides Jesus, who could fulfill all answers to the body of Christ. <laughs> like that is just a recipe for pride and independence. And so I t personally do not actually agree that that is true. Uh, so for a long time, I just didn't even talk or think about the fivefold ministry gifts. But someone recently who I trust actually explained it a little bit differently to to me, which is that it's a way uh, it's a way that the Holy Spirit operates in that it those individuals who would say have the fivefold ministry gifts that the Holy Spirit can actually empower whichever of those gifts is really necessary at the time. So. You know, uh, you know, it may be that the community of God at one point really needs someone who is a prophet and so they can operate in that prophecy realm. And then sometimes it could be that there is someone with an apostleship gift that that community really needs and so that person can operate in that. So they're sort of like the equivalent of being a jack of all trades but a master of none. So that kind of seems a little bit more likely to me rather than believing that this one person can actually empower, like have all five gifts operating in them all the time. Like why would anyone else need to contribute to the body of Christ if that person fulfills all five? That's that's where I'm coming from anyway. However, I ultimately think we can get bogged down with these kind of fivefold gifting stuff, right? So, so much of the discussion around spiritual gifts like end up being around stuff like this. And I think that trying to identify them in other people, these fivefold ministry gifting, you know, people, um, it, it's it's just not warranted. And not enough focus is given to how exactly those those individuals who have those specific appointments equip the body of Christ. Um, I'm not talking about leadership philosophies here, right? I'm talking about how exactly those gifts or roles equip others. Because if I'm being honest, I only really see teachers and maybe evangelists like equipping the body of Christ. And that's not necessarily the fault of those individuals who have those giftings either. You know, like 
there's probably uh, an overemphasis on leadership in the church as far as like a spiritual gift is concerned. And obviously leadership doesn't exactly sit on that list because I've met many leaders who are not apostles and who are not evangelists and are not prophetic and are definitely not shepherds. And so like, but shepherds, you know, um, a person who actually cares like intimately for their flock is on this list. So I do think there is quite a major imbalance here in terms of how those individual gifts that fulfill those particular roles equip across the body of Christ. Okay, I admit I digress. So what kind of gifts can you have? Well, besides those that I've already mentioned, which were apostleship, prophecy, evangelism, shepherding, and teaching, there is also mercy, intercessory prayer, administration, which some would call leadership. That's It may be the equivalent of leadership as we perceive leadership in the church these days, but it doesn't necessarily. And we got to remember that the word administration doesn't necessarily, like in Scripture, does not necessarily link up to how we define administration today. It, we're not talking about a clerk who processes papers, right? So, um, and not to say that that's not important too, but that's not necessarily what administration in scriptures is talking about. Uh, Sorry, I'll keep going. So there is also discernment, exhortation, which means encouragement, but it's more than just, hey, you're so good looking. Like, actually, I don't know if I've ever said that to someone, but it's, it's an exhortation is like an encouragement that, literally infuses courage and faith into someone, right? Then, of course, there is faith. Faith is also a spiritual gift. Then there's healing, there's giving, there's tongues and interpretation, and, of course, leadership, service, hospitality, and wisdom. So as far as I'm concerned, they're kind of considered the key ones. That's what you would find on that spiritualgiftstest.com website. But, yes, that's that's like what's considered the list, I guess. People far more gifted than I have actually taken the time to glean from Scripture all of these different kinds of spiritually empowered gifts. So you should go and read what spiritualgiftstest.com actually describe for each of those individual gifts because uh, I have not done that work and they have and they would be much better suited to learn from in that regard Uh, But because also – you may see that it's not necessarily so explicitly in Scripture that, oh, this is a spiritual gift and that's a spiritual gift. They've been able to take out of Scripture that these are obviously spiritual gifts as it is defined in Scripture. So anyway, that's a little bit of advice, some practical advice, go do that. But every believer gets a spiritual gift. It's not our choosing, but we certainly can steward it and we can grow in our ability to discern the Holy Spirit's guidance in the use of those gifts. So for instance, when it comes to prophecy, you know, I've talked to you guys many times about how I specifically have prophetic dreams. The more I have listened and taken note and prayed about those dreams, the more I've seen God use the dreams and increase the number of dreams I've had. So if I go back and look at my, because I use just, I'm such a nerd, I know, I use a spreadsheet and I have got dreams that I have listed probably from back in 2016. What the number of dreams I wrote down in 2016 versus this year alone is all probably already like three times the amount. So there has been an increase because I have responded, I believe, I have responded to God's giving this gift. I have gone Yes, God, I will steward this. I will learn. I will grow. I will continue to be faithful in noting them, in in pursuing you, in understanding them. And then, of course, in the last six months, I've actually seen a real increase in my ability to understand them, whereas I used to have hundreds of dreams before and I would often have no idea what they meant and be very, like, burdened by that as well. My stewardship process has also been learning how to wait because, you know, one of the things with like something like prophecy is that um, God has a timing for how he also reveals the meaning. So you must wait. And that was not something I did so well in the beginning. But these days I have like a piece around that. 
There's also the fact that I had to learn how to steward in terms of who I trusted to share those dreams with. And, um, and sometimes I don't share them at all. Like it just depends on the dream. And, um, yeah, I mean, that's a stewardship process. That's all, all of us have to learn something about that in terms of how we do what we do. Now, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to go through each gift in detail. I would actually love to because I just think spiritual gifts are amazing and I would love to be able to empower you that way, but we just really don't have the time in this particular episode, right? But I will allude to the best I can to different gifts and just give you some kind of snippet of something relating to that gift. Hopefully that can be a little nugget for you to be able to take away and kind of go, how can I practically apply this, right? So the big question is, why would I need to talk about this? Like, why am I bringing this up? How does the pink elephant of depth, this overarching theme that has permeated the entire podcast, right? How does our lack of depth diminish the value of this scriptural topic? Well, I'm glad you asked. I think you asked. Anyway, there are several ways in which we see a lack of depth in the comprehension and the practice of spiritual gifts today right? Number one, a very significant number of Christians have no idea what a spiritual gift is and the fact that they have been given one, let alone what their gift might be. Now that's huge to me, especially when you consider the amount of conversation and discussion in scripture about spiritual gifts. So to be fair, much of this culture is also contributed to by the fact that there's very little I shouldn't say very little, but there is not as much teaching as you would presume in general about spiritual gifts in church community. Not all, of course, like there's obviously many churches who do, and there's many churches who might provide coaching around specific spiritual gifts. Like I know there are churches that do definitely focus on the gift of prophecy or healing or teaching. So in general, though, it would be hard for every Christian to know about something that really gets discussed. On the other hand, there are plenty of volunteer programs that introduce you to your spiritual gifts, but they don't necessarily give you a lot of information about what it means and how you could grow it. And I know that because I used to run them. I was always a little disappointed, though, that the reason we would think to do a spiritual gifts test was to assist in the volunteer engagement process and not because we in general value the spiritual gifts enough to teach it. But that's just my two cents, right? Unfortunately, it just means that people don't understand how significant it is to have been given a gift, nor do they value the gift in themselves or others. See, one of the contexts of 1 Corinthians, which is like got so many like issues within that particular book, right, that Paul is actually addressing, but one of the contexts, this highly quoted book, is, is specifically addressing spiritual gifts and their use. Yes, he is chastising the Corinthians for their use of the gifts, but the underlying presupposition is that the spiritual gifts are actively being used in the community of God, very actively actually compared to our standards today. The love passage, 1 Corinthians 13, possibly one of the most well-known passages in our society, a classic choice for a Bible reading at weddings for both Christians and non-Christians alike, is in the context of a conversation on spiritual gifts. Paul is encouraging them to ensure that love is still the highest value when we consider our actions, including how we use spiritual gifts. So the fact that so few Christians know and understand the spiritual gifts God has given them and consider it a low priority to use them is actually quite shocking. Number two, There are some gifts that are greatly prioritized in the body of Christ and others that are almost completely forgotten. Teaching is probably the most emphasized gift in the body of Christ these days. And now I understand why there is a high accountability for those who teach. James 3.1 says, Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. That passage doesn't seem to stop so many people wanting to be teachers, of course, though. But teaching is not meant to be taken lightly. That is the point of that verse. But when we read Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 12, we see that he is adamant that there is no benefit in ranking the gifts since none can be done without. 
He says from verse 20 to 26, As it is, there are many parts but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head of the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honourable, we bestow the greater honour. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honour to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honoured, all rejoice together. There is just so much gold in this passage. The parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. That's what Paul says. Let me tell you what the church often treats as the weaker parts as far as spiritual gifts are concerned. Those with a hospitality gift. All the churches I have been to have presumed that hospitality means cooking. So some event will come around and the leaders will go, um, we need some food, you know, like because we're going to be busy doing it. We need someone to cook some food. So just give it to such and such because they've got a hospitality gift. And that person is stuck in a kitchen by themselves, single-handedly trying to feed an entire hungry populace. Whilst the leaders are outside enjoying themselves with their coffee and their meals, completely relaxed, giving very little thought to the person in the kitchen. Okay, I'm obviously like exaggerating the situation a lot, but I'm trying to demonstrate something here. So let me demonstrate how much we undervalue this indispensable gift. The word in scripture used for hospitality in the New Testament is philoxenia, which I know I've stuffed up. But anyway, you can go have a look for yourself. The meaning of this word is lover of strangers. We demonstrate our lack of depth when we suggest that this word means cooking. Now, don't get me wrong, cooking is important. It is a blessing. I had a great meal last night and I'm happy about it. But based on this definition, hospitality may or may not involve any domestic or practical tasks. And how beautiful is this language, lover of strangers? Oh, it's just lovely. Is this not an indispensable gift? What could it do for our small groups, our churches and families if we rightly honoured the gift of hospitality in the body of Christ? What impact might it have for those who are searching for Christ? You know, I've heard many testimonies of someone who has given their life to Christ because of a preacher's expounding of Christian doctrine. They've preached a great message, right? But I have equally heard of as many testimonies of salvation on account of the actions of a generous and hospitable person. Now let me take this further again. There is even fear in relationship to some gifts. Let's talk about apostleship. I mentioned earlier that it's the most consistent gift I get when I do spiritual gifts tests, right? And and I've also had it prophesied over me at a conference and all that kind of stuff, right? But in my early days exploring the spiritual gifts, I literally had no idea what apostleship was and I didn't know anyone who also had this gift. And worse yet, it was next to impossible to find any information about it. I once met a leader and they asked me, like, what is your spiritual gift? You know, like, it's great that she asked me that question, but, yeah, like, she asked me. And I said, you know, very matter-of-factly, apostleship. And even before the word had fully escaped my mouth, she said, well, you don't appoint yourself as an apostle. The church will do that. In fact, you should probably not tell any people about that. Uh, like, what? Like, at the time, I didn't even know enough about the church and the functions of the church and all that kind of stuff to understand what she was saying. So I almost walked away feeling ashamed about this spiritual gift that I knew nothing about. So let me address the controversy, right? So Because there is a controversy here when it comes to apostleship. Some believers don't recognize the gift of apostleship. They believe that apostleship came and died with the original 12 appointed back when Jesus was on earth. I mean, we, of course, make a few exceptions, like, of course, Apostle Paul, who had an encounter with Jesus after his ascension. And there are others, too, that Paul calls an apostle, including 
Andronicus and Junia, Junia being one who is believed by some theologians to have been a female apostle, although, of course, much debate still surrounds this. Now, I don't know if that's true. I don't know if there are people that deserve the title of apostle in this day and age. Where the difference really matters, though, is the distinction between the gift of apostleship and the office of the apostle. That's what this leader was really trying to tell me when she said, don't appoint yourself as an apostle. She's saying that the office of the apostle is the issue. And I have to admit that after she told me this and I came to understand a little bit more about it, that I did discover many people online and otherwise that are self-proclaimed apostles as in they're sort of declaring themselves to play this function in the body of Christ that nobody appointed to them. They have self-appointed. Uh, And, you know, it was pretty concerning, some of the behaviours that I saw and some of the doctrines that they preach about. So it was good advice. But the downside of such apostles in the atmosphere is that believers with a genuine apostleship gift are silenced and undeveloped. So over the last 15 years or so from the time from which I had this prophecy spoken over me and also did a spiritual gifts test like not long after that, I have gathered more and more information and I have a lot better understanding about apostleship as a gift, but admittedly it has been in an ad hoc kind of way. And I find I can see it in other believers and I at least try to encourage them, but it's taken a lot of time. You know, it's not like the one-year leadership program that you could do like those with a leadership gift or a prophetic program where you go and do a term and you grow in your prophetic gift. There has been nothing like that that I've been made aware of or been led to in my journey as like a person with an apostleship gift. Now, people with a gift of apostleship can't remain silent forever. It's it's just not in their makeup. There's a guy in the USA and he began a movement called the New Evangelicals. He has come to represent Christians who are deconstructing, but based on his story, I don't think that's how it started out anyway. I believe he was responding to a culture that he saw in the like broader church, in the broader, broader body of Christ in America, a, a classic apostleship trait, by the way, noticing things around culture, but his own pastor was not happy with what he was doing. Side note, those with a shepherding gift or even a leadership gift sometimes will struggle with an apostleship gift because they can't, they struggle with how radical an apostle can be, like an apostleship gift, right? And the shepherd who often wants to maintain the status quo because their impulse is to protect the sheep can often find it really difficult with someone who does have an apostleship gift. So this is you know, part of the reason why it's really sad that uh, apostleship is not really talked about a lot because there is a way to learn how to steward that too, right? Anyway, a conversation with his pastor is probably what sent him over the edge and he left his church and now he is very much deconstructing himself but he's also leading a movement of people who are deconstructing. And I follow him and I and I actually really appreciate a lot of things that he contributes like from a discussion perspective around the church. And um but he has like 35,000 followers on Instagram alone. He has interns, he has merchandise. He gets invited to go on to podcasts and and be interviewed and I believe he has a podcast himself and, yeah, he's literally doing so much more, right? He basically, just have a think about this, has the same number of people following him on Instagram as the weekly attendance of what is considered one of the biggest churches in America, right, which is Craig Grishel's Life Church. I believe the weekly attendance at one of his churches is 35,000. So, it is arguable that he has the same level of engagement as a mega church. He is what I would describe as having an apostleship gifting. Say what you want about what he is leading, but there is no denying the apostleship gift on his life. Now, then there's the preachers and sneakers guy, Ben Kirby, right? Another Christian personality that believers divide over. And I personally happen to love the guy. I read his book and I I ate it up. His book was humble and thought-provoking. And he did actually have something to say about the culture of church. And I don't think it's wrong to contribute that, that thought and that belief that he has, right? So I don't care what anyone says, right? I absolutely believe that this guy has an apostleship gift. He may have accidentally become prominent, but what he has done to address a previously unaccounted for culture in the church, again, there's that apostleship trait, nobody was voicing this concern over the unusual relationship between leaders, money, and image until this guy came along. 
love him or hate him, he has brought some accountability that didn't exist before, that denominations in the US were not like holding leaders accountable for. So anyway, that's my viewpoint on that. Here's the thing though. I think it is highly amusing that the habit of ranking spiritual gifts in the Corinthian church all that time back then in 1 Corinthians 12 is still happening today. And maybe I shouldn't be surprised, but it is certainly an area that we could all improve on. Number three, there is often little opportunity to use the gifts and people are waiting for permission to do so. So even if you know what your spiritual gift is and you understand it, there isn't necessarily permission to use your gift, depending on what they are, of course, because some gifts like, say, prayer, you don't necessarily need the permission to use it. Although I do know intercessors really love being asked and called on to pray. You get my point. Not every gift requires permission, but a lot of people do hold back because they don't have the permission. So for many, the sheer layout of a church service prohibits the usage of spiritual gifts. Well, at least it prohibits the usage of all spiritual gifts, right? Service outlines are very strict these days and they're structured and having someone get up and speak a tongue and interpret for 10 minutes is not really easily allowable. There are some churches that I've had to learn I I just cannot really share my prophetic dreams with because they don't value dreams. And now that's okay. I can deal with that. That's been part of my stewardship journey as well. And I'm not trying to get attention with this thing anyway, right? Like when I have a prophetic dream, I'm not like – you know, trying to get attention by sharing it. I'm just trying to be faithful to God with a gift that he's given me. But I admit I would be quite concerned if a new Christian were to begin demonstrating this spiritual gift in in that church because they may not be encouraged to pay attention to it and therefore they miss out on something incredible that God has meant for them to A, experience for themselves, but B, meant to serve the church with. So they may want to contribute to church and contribute to the body of Christ, but if they are not being able to be encouraged or being given the permission of value, they may not do it. If you found yourself in this situation where you've had a spiritual gift that you want to grow in, but there's like no, you know, either no opportunity or value of that gift in your church community, my encouragement to you is to find other believers outside of your church that you can connect with around this. There is a good chance that no church is going to faithfully value every single gift as God values it. And that's okay to a degree, but that doesn't mean that you are limited. Remember, your gift is still your responsibility to steward and grow in. And the great thing about these days, like with all of the online forums and Instagram and Facebook groups and all the rest of it, is that there is just so much ability to connect around things like spiritual gifts. I myself have done some prophetic courses, I've done leadership programs and a whole host of other things and it's helped me to grow in my gifts and and steward this amazing thing that God has given me. So let's go deeper. Why again do we need to talk about these matters? Like I've given you three really good reasons. They don't really seem so deeply spiritual, I guess. It's not an earth-shattering revelation. Why do we need to talk about this, Mel? Come on. A couple of years ago, I had an epic dream. It was like a one in a million dream. There were like three scenes to the dream and I could remember every single detail. And I actually got together with my connect group leaders, like my sort of key team, and relayed this dream onto them. And we all agreed that God had actually given me a strategy for our connect groups ministry, which was just amazing. It just blew me away. And, you know, some of my old Connect Group leaders like do listen to this podcast and I'm really confident they they probably remember when I came to them about this dream and how excited we were. And the reality is I prayed and I prayed for weeks to understand the key principles of this strategy because I wanted to be able to write it down so that we could implement it and, and, you know, um, give it the value that it actually had, right? And one day the Holy Spirit revealed it to me, this the key central element of this strategy was belonging. So I began to research and research and research this concept called belonging, which no doubt one day I will write about. But one of the key aspects of belonging that kept emerging through the research I was doing was this idea of contribution. The research made it clear that contributing to an organization, a family, a group, whatever the collective of people it is that you belong to or you're a part of, 
that your contribution increases your feelings of connectedness and belonging to the greater group. And, you know, it just made sense. Like when you think about it, right, I've sat in so many leaders meetings where overcommitted volunteers will, you know, make comments like, why aren't people willing to do more? Why aren't they willing to do what I do? Why don't they turn up? Well, it's kind of obvious, right? High level volunteers know how to uniquely contribute themselves and they also feel valued for the contribution they make. So of course, contribution increases a person's sense of belonging. When Paul used the analogy of a human body to describe how the people of God relate and work together, it was no accident. As always, the writers of Scripture were writing insights that were beyond the understanding they actually had at the time, a great sign of the Spirit of God's wisdom anointing them as they wrote. 1 Corinthians 12 becomes a critical passage for all believers then. What did Paul say again in this passage? Well, I'm going to help you summarize, right? Firstly, he said, we cannot say we have no need of you to any other member, which means every individual that believes in Jesus is needed. Every gift is needed. Then he says, the parts of the body that seem weaker, they are in fact indispensable, indispensable. We cannot do without them. They are necessities. We are not complete as the body if we have people unable to contribute to the body of Christ. And for the leaders listening to this episode, it's not necessarily up to them to slot into our pre-prepared volunteer roles. When our responsibility is to equip the body of Christ, it's our problem if they don't understand how to use their gifts and live out their Christian life with it. Then Paul even goes so far to say that those parts of the body that we think less honourable, we bestow the greater honour. It is our duty as believers to give greater value and respect to those gifts that are often seen as less valuable, like service or mercy or exhortation. Those gifts that believers contribute behind the scenes that few see, we are supposed to see and we are supposed to honour, value and respect it. If the only things that we ever praise are the things that are seen, we will have lost the battle here, right? Then he goes on again in verse 25. He says that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. This is so countercultural. I have worked in so many workplaces where there is division between certain groups of labor, certain departments all because there is not actually mutual care, all because certain departments are valued as greater and cared for more than others. Like in a school where there is a difference between the teachers and the administrators or in an airline where the engineers are looked after better than the cabin crew, the body of Christ is the one place where this need not be so. Imagine if we assign the people in the body of Christ with a monetary value. Right now, we know that the distribution would not be equal. We know that we would see some people as grossly exaggerated in value against others. Some would be a million dollars. Some would be 200,000. Some, maybe the ones we have forgotten about because they stopped coming to services, would be $5. Unfortunately, those people representing $5 often know that this is their value to the church, hence why they stop coming. That $5 assignment was given to them well before they left and they know it. Anyway, here's the point of the analogy, right? Paul is saying everyone's assigned value is a million dollars. Everyone receives the same care. We listen as attentively to everyone as we would the pastor. Everyone is given time, resources and support as equally as we would give to the person we want to help the most. Lastly, Paul says, In verse 26, if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honoured, all rejoice together. How humbling is this? This verse is a reminder of our interconnectedness. We affect each other. We cannot simply say that this is not my responsibility because another's suffering is our collective suffering. We all benefit from each other. This is the way God intends that we do community. 
I've talked about it before, but my heart really hurts for the disillusioned, right? That's why I wrote a book about it. The people who have left church communities because they are so confused. I sense their suffering and I suffer with them. We all have those areas where we feel specifically burdened, right? But God is asking that we feel the burden of our brothers and sisters that do not feel valued and loved in the body of Christ because their gift differs in appearance and even glamour. So here's the point, which I realise I say that a lot, but let's get to the crux of it, right? God doesn't stipulate, nor does Paul stipulate in this analogy, which gift or person is represented as an eye or a hand or a foot. He doesn't stipulate the level of importance each gift has so explicitly, although there are some debatable passages and it's not necessarily explicit or conclusive either. In 1 Corinthians 14, Paul calls prophecy of greater value than tongues unless someone interprets the tongue. He says this because he argues that prophecy builds up the church, but an uninterpreted tongue only builds up the individual. That's his logic for such a statement. If an interpreter unpacks the tongue, though, that tongue is no longer lesser than a prophecy. So the only way he categorizes these gifts is the degree to which they support and encourage the body of Christ versus its individual benefit. But within all of the gifts that are contributing to the body, he makes no distinction. If all gifts are contributing to the body, he doesn't say one is lesser or one is greater. They are of equal value. Some people argue that the five ministry gifts, the five-fold ministry gifts, have been given in order of importance, which, if it is true, we have grossly fallen short of. They argue that apostles are first, prophets second, evangelists third, shepherds fourth, and teachers fifth, as per the passage in Ephesians 4. Now, to be honest, the only person I've ever really heard argue this point strongly was a person who was complaining about the lack of honour they felt as someone with an apostleship gift. So, yeah, to be clear, I don't really agree with his interpretation of this passage, but at the same token, I don't really know. Like, I can't be clear. I think the more critical part we should be concerned about is whether these five giftings do have an opportunity to equip as Scripture implores them to. But still, we can be sure that God doesn't stipulate through the imagery in 1 Corinthians 12 that there is some kind of difference amidst the gifts That he is given to the body. So if he doesn't, why would we believe that we have the right to interpret the gifts for ourselves differently? Why do we believe that we can discount some and elevate others? God has not done this and he does not give us the authority to do so either. We must assume that any gift could represent any part of the body. Maybe service is the heart. Maybe discernment is the arm. Maybe apostleship is the knee. We don't really know, though we usually already have our own assumptions and prejudgments according to how we interpret the value of the gifts. So how have you overlooked the spiritual gifts that God has given the body of Christ? How have you failed to look at the gifts he has given you as equal in contribution and value to those you would like to emulate? How have you upheld the value of the flashy preacher over the intercessor or the evangelist over the discerner? Would you listen to them equally if they had something to say? How might you have undervalued those gifts that Paul describes as indispensable? Maybe you felt excluded and rejected because your gift seemed indispensable and all you've wanted to do was contribute. Well, I pray that God can heal your heart, even as you have listened to this episode. The spiritual gifts are important. They are critical to the survival of the body of Christ. It is critical to your own faith, and it is critical to your relationship with the church. Most of all, it is a free gift that our generous God has lavished upon us all because he is such a great giver. What will you do? with your gift. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Pink Elephant. You can follow me on Instagram, Facebook, or you can check out my resources on my website, meljsayward.com.